Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a core focus of the event this year is uh, we're discussing big trends over the next decade uh, and really looking to inspire the next generation of founders. Um, you're, of course, in rarefied air, creating a software company that's hit a billion in revenue, not even a billion in valuation, a billion in revenue, uh, growing at 40% compounding over the last several years. Uh, so you've obviously been through the startup in the scale up phase. So uh, I figure let's start with your personal story for how you arrived at HubSpot as the idea that you wanted to pursue uh, 16 years ago now, right? Yeah, it's been 16 years. Um, and uh, welcome everyone, uh, thanks for joining. So you know, HubSpot was my third startup. Um, I had done software startups essentially my entire professional career. I have not really um, had a real job, and um, as, as founders know that, and once you've done a startup, you're basically unemployable after that point, right? It's a, it's, it's a, it's a calling. Um, so uh, let, let's talk about HubSpot since that's the most recent um, and around idea selection, because I think that's something founders often, um, or even would-be founders, struggle with. Um, so I met my co-founder in grad school. I had sold my last company, and my kind of motivation for going to grad school was it was a kind of a soft landing. I promised my wife I would never do another startup again because she had lived through uh, the first two. Um, and she, you know, she often jokes that if she'd known I was going to be an entrepreneur, you know, she, mm -hmm. she wasn't sure that that's what she would uh, buy into. But anyways, I went to grad school and uh, with no intentions of, of doing a startup. And I met my co-founder, uh, Brian Halligan, um, you know, in, in my uh, classes at, uh, at MIT. And you know, we were just kind of new. Like he's got a startup background as well. I uh, hadn't founded a company before, but I had worked for startups. And so we were noodling on kind of just a bunch of ideas. And um, the thing that we kind of really gravitated towards is this notion of serving small, medium-sized businesses. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our kind of our rationale here was uh, we're both practical, um, you know, practical people. It's like, okay, well, startups often kind of fall into one of two camps. If you're going to do a consumer company, it's like, oh, it could be, you know, billions of dollars. It could be the next Facebook, the next Google, whatever. Um, but those types of ideas tend to be, um, lead to very kind of binary outcomes. Either you're super successful or it goes down in crashing, burning flames and never you know, amounts to anything. On the flip side of the equation, which is where both of us had grown up, uh, was enterprise software, where very, you know, practical, predictable revenue growth. Uh, you may or may not make it to billions of dollars, but you might make it to 10, you might make it to 50, you might make it to 100, but there's going to be you know, there's a decent chance you'll have some positive outcome, at least better chance than, than what you see in, in, in consumer. What struck us as interesting about SMB was it had a mix of both. So you had the scale of consumer, there's millions of SMBs out there to serve, but then you have the pragmatism of enterprise software, which you can solve a problem with software and you can charge money, you know, an old, old fashioned business um, and actually get revenue relatively early on. So that was the first thing we kind of uh, latched onto. And we hadn't really thought about doing startup per se at the time. But then as we kind of dug into it, one of the things we discovered was SMBs um, were not really doing very well at marketing and growth, um, mm -hmm. whether you were a startup or even a, a traditional business. And, and the reason was that marketing um, at the time um, was fairly broken. The classic approach to marketing was, hey, I've got this budget, however big or small, I'm going to spend that budget to blast my message to as many people as possible in the hopes that some small fraction of people care about what I have to sell and will buy from me, right? You, you bought email lists, you went and bought a list of phone numbers and cold called, you did all these things that we call um, outbound marketing. And we thought there was a better way, which is, hey, why not use that same small budget to actually add value to your potential customers and pull them in through content, videos, webinars, uh, free tools, that kind of thing. Um, so we thought that was like a transition that was happening. And then when we actually talked to businesses, um, the reason they weren't doing it is because they're sitting on the sidelines, they weren't leveraging the internet hardly at all, is because it was just too hard. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a dearth of tools. There was great applications for web analytics and content management and social media, search engine optimization. Every category in marketing had great products with great companies behind them. The challenge was near mortal companies couldn't really pull it all together. Um, and, and so we kind of set out to, uh, build a, a platform uh, that was kind of an all-in-one thing to solve this kind of marketing problem. And the kind of one thing I've learned about ideas um, across three startups now, and having talked to a, a bunch of other founders um, over the years, is that too many founders make the mistake of waiting 
for that exceptionally good idea before they start their company. It's like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, well, and they'll analyze it and they'll look at market search results, like, and they'll, and which is great. You know, it's great to have some uh, degree of rigor and discipline. But in my experience, most of the kind of best ideas don't occur to founders until after they start the company, until mm -hmm. after they try and build a product, until they actually try and sell a product. It's like, and so HubSpot, our original thing in SMB was we were going to build an ERP, like an Oracle for small business, mm -hmm. like a next generation Oracle. And our first vertical that we were going to go after was uh, law firms. So we're going to go after small, medium sized law firms as the first bowling pin. And then as we started talking to companies, it's like, okay, well, that's interesting, you know, time management and doc management, all the things that a, a law firm might need. But the one piece that they, they found most interesting was the kind of marketing portion of it. And so we're like, okay, that's where the actual opportunity. So we kept, we kept the customer constant, still SMBs, uh, broadened it from, from just law firms. Um, but I found this to be true is that um, you shouldn't let the lack of an exceptionally good idea um, hold you back uh, because often that idea won't come to you uh, until afterwards. And kind of uh, the other thing I've learned related to kind of idea selection is it's really, really hard a prior. Let's say you had 10 possible ideas to actually know even pick amongst those 10, which one the best is. And you can kind of rank them and you can create Google spreadsheets and um, around, oh, here are the ranking factors for ideas. Um, once again, helpful, but it is not always predictive. Um, so my, my advice generally is if you have some semblance of an idea or a customer segment you want to go after, you have some unique domain insight or customer insight or access to a market, just start. Uh, and then as you kind of evolve the company, um, the better and better idea will start to kind of come to you. But mm -hmm. That's that's great. That's great advice. Um, how do you approach um, the idea selection uh, as you're looking to expand products? Um, do you go through the exact same uh, motions of you have a set of ideas and just go talk to customers? And that's also how HubSpot has managed to grow into new in, in new directions. Or is there a different approach once you've landed yeah, on I think your it's, first big idea? Yeah, there's some common elements, but it's different um, when you're you know, time T equals zero, starting to kind of pick an idea that you're going to kind of start the company with. Mm -hmm. uh, everything's kind of a blue ocean. You know, you can, like, you haven't done anything yet. There's no yeah. kind of invested capital. There's no team that's been recruited. Uh, once you're going and you have a, um, you know, somewhat successful product, which is the only time you should be looking at product N equals two is after N equals one, uh, you know, gets to product market fit and has some traction. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're picking that one, I think the important thing when going from N equals one to N equals two um, is you have to sort of know why you're doing it. Um, and there's kind of categories of reasons. Uh, one reason might be that, oh, the first product did really well. It's been growing, but I'm just kind of seeing it start to kind of taper off now, either because we've hit market saturation, we're in a niche market, and most of the people that needed to buy our product have likely already done so, and the ones that haven't are less likely to do so over time. And so we're kind of hitting some ceiling. That's kind of reason number one. Uh, reason number two is it could be opportunistic that says, okay, well, Product one is doing well, but we want to start the next S curve. We want to invest early because it's going to take some time, and we're going to and we've got the capital to do it. And we're going to start layering in uh, what many call kind of Act Two mm. of the business. And the third reason is there is some natural adjacency that says, okay, our customers expect us to have this product in addition to this one, and it's borderline. This is the case with HubSpot. Um, it's almost a borderline existential crisis: is that you cannot not build that second product because in the long run, over the fullness of time. Whoever has that kind of more full product portfolio is going to end up winning the overall game. And mm -hmm. so you can't just sit with the first product that you were successful with because over time, the absence of that second product is just essentially going to, to kill you. And that's where we sort of found ourselves because we started in the marketing software business yeah. um, and we were working with you know, the popular CRMs, customer relationship management systems. And we recognized that over time, if we did not have a CRM ourselves, those CRM companies were eventually going to get into marketing someday. Mm. And since they own the system of record, if we did not have a CRM alternative. Yeah. It was just a matter of time before our market got eroded and it would be hard for us to kind of grow long-term. So ours, it was a combination of the, oh, we see this growth opportunity in CRM. Um, and then the second one was a defensive. We can't not build a kind of CRM and sales product because it just goes hand in hand with marketing. So that was, uh, but the important kind of takeaway is, before you start that second product, um, make sure you know why you're doing it. That's uh, yeah. thing number one. Um, and thing number two is recognize that, you know, I think the mistake founders make sometimes when doing the second product is they, 
everyone looks at the Excel spreadsheet. So here's the potential revenue. Here's all the upside that's going to come as a result of the second product. And they may, um, you know, kind of second order, they might come back and say, oh, yeah, and it's going to take us this much kind of R&D dollars to kind of develop that second product. Um, okay. What they often fail to uh, really recognize is the, the cost of complexity when you go from N equals one to N equals two. And mm -hmm. that's not a linear, oh, our business is 10% more complicated than it used to be. It is a multiple more complicated. It's three times, 10 times more complicated because what ends up happening is that, let's say you start with one product um, and you go to product number two. Now, every chart you look at, you're going to have to mm -hmm. want to break it down. It's like, oh, revenues from product one versus product two. Every investment you make is like, how much do we invest in product one versus product two? <laughs> we just hired a new engineer. Do we put them on product one or product two? We're going to go do a launch campaign, a marketing campaign. How much do we spend on promoting the new product versus uh, you know maintaining our business? It's like everything becomes dimensionally harder. Um, and so you have to make sure that you have, and no organization to be perfectly set up to do it, but that you have enough stability in the business to mm -hmm. kind of take on that complexity. If you're already struggling with uh, kind of keeping the metrics and instrumentation, all these things and kind of right. prioritizing with the product one, uh, it's usually a bad idea to kind of jump into product two at that time, uh, unless there's some kind of compelling reason to do it. Right, got it. And then, uh, I, you know, as I've come across founders, um, I've come across founders who have no experience in any company prior, right? So they're effectively coming in fresh out of school uh, sometimes dropping out of school and starting a company. And so they have to really not unlearn anything, right? They're kind of starting fresh. Yeah. And then there are founders who are coming from companies who I found they actually need to unlearn certain things they've picked up at companies um, because uh, the types of rituals that have worked at larger companies, especially as it comes to product expansion, or in some cases, um, uh, a pursuing some product as a defensive maneuver doesn't quite work when you're starting at T equals zero. So yeah. this question is what characteristics or what learnings do you find founders have to unlearn when they're going from a larger company to their own company? Yeah, a couple of things. One is uh, if you're coming from a larger company, which many founders do, you know, they work you know, for a big tech company or something like that and um, are doing their own thing. The biggest one is around recognizing that um, big companies can afford to hedge their bets. Big companies mm -hmm. think in kind of portfolios of risk that says, oh, we've got these seven product lines. We're going to add this eighth one and they can they can hedge. Um, they can afford to hedge. In fact, that's their kind of natural state is to kind of mitigate risk. Mm -hmm. um, and so the thing you have to kind of unlearn is that uh, what makes a startup a startup is this willingness to kind of take calculated, well thought out risks. It's like if you try mm -hmm. to avoid risk, that's the easiest way to fall into kind of mediocrity, right? Because if you do what the average company would do at your scale or any scale, the average company dies, right? Like that's, mm -hmm. that, that is not the way to kind of uh, build a, a breakthrough success. So that's one thing is to kind of recognize um, that, you know, risk is actually a good thing that, that um, mm -hmm. if, because you're doing something that uh, if there was zero risk to it, the bigger companies would have already done it. It's, it's kind of well-trodden ground. So that's thing number one. Um, the other thing is around, the kinds of people um, that are going to be successful. When you're in a big company, you're around other people that are also like you, right? And, and there's a certain thing they solve for. So they'll solve for, um, you know, what I broadly define as specialists. Like in every possible role, they have someone that's done that particular thing for 10 years, they're at the top of their game. And that's great for a big company. A, you have the resources and you have the brand and you also know, know what you're doing. So if you know what the product and market is, then you can say, oh, well, we're in the crypto space. We're in the video video business or whatever. So we need engineers that really get video codecs or get whatever the thing is, uh, the domain expertise. In most startups, uh, time to equal zero, you have no idea what the idea is actually going to end up being that you're going to pursue. Mm -hmm. So any kind of resources, money you spend um, trying to get a deep specialist, I won't say it's wasted, um, but it's probably misguided because it's not. you're not going to get the same return on that specialization that a large company would. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's tempting to go around. It's like, oh, I want to find just those same kinds of people uh, that I was working with in the big company that was really, really good at whatever it was, um, and then kind of bring them down. Um, there's this big, and the founder themselves have to kind of make that um, kind of atmospheric adjustment. Um, and the temptation is to go out and just hire people that you've worked with before that are uh, in that same. But you're probably better off actually uh, having at least some, if not most of the people in your team that are not going through that aspect. Uh, it's like, oh, they didn't just all come from a big company. Some of them are earlier in their careers. This might be yeah. their first startup and that's okay. Uh, ignorance is a 
completely fine thing. Most of the things um, a startup needs to know in the early stages, they're all learnable skills. The fact mm -hmm. that you haven't done it before, the fact that this is your first time, you're right out of school or you dropped out of school, none of that really ends up mattering all that much. I mean, yeah, you'll make some mistakes that might've been avoidable, um, but even people that sort of knew uh, that those were mistakes still end up making them anyway. There's some things, it's some kind of a, a rite of passage almost. So I wouldn't worry too much about kind of lack of, you know, skill set and specialization in the early days. Uh, I think you're better off with generalists um, versus specialists, people that um, kind of kind of attach themselves to problems, are committed to it, and have the raw wattage to kind of, um, you know, are analytical enough to kind of solve solve big hard problems. Yeah, I've heard a, uh, a framework, um, uh, I don't know where it's from, but you, you take any startup idea and you order it by the top three risks. And then you want to have an individual who can go own each risk. And, and that's how you can attack a particular startup idea and make sure that you end up in the right place. Um, so th there, there are definitely some really useful frameworks to how to think about the right team to bring together. Um, yep. How do you map that to this idea of generalists, right? So sometimes mm -hmm. a risk may require specialists. Sometimes you just, you, you want high caliber, high throughput generalists who can then learn very quickly. I guess in what cases is a specialist useful? And in yep. what in what cases is a generalist, a team of generalists uh, work out fine? Yeah, that's a great question. So we'll take a half step back and we'll talk about kind of risk categorization. Um, and I, I think of there's like several buckets of risk that um, early stage companies encounter. One is product risk, will I be able to build the thing that I envision? Like, this is the thing I want to build. Can mm -hmm. I actually create the thing? Uh, another is, uh, you know, financing risk. It's like, okay, I, I'm, I've got the skill set. I know I can build it, but will I have enough capital based on the type of business being built to be able to fund the thing that I want to build? Uh, assuming like that works, is there a market? The market risk is like, assuming I can build the thing and I can get the capital to get to where I want, is there a large enough market to build a sustainable, um, you know, high growth, um, high growth company? I think the mistake most tech founders make, including myself, um, is our instinctive reaction uh, when we start is to mitigate that first, like the uh, time t equals zero. The first thing a tech founder is going to go do is start writing code, right? That's, <laughs> that's our, uh, it's like, and, and we hear, and we kind of have this um, thing in our heads, like, oh, it's all about product. It's all about product. It's all about product, mm -hmm. which it is, but that is not the, uh, the highest kind of impactful risk that you need to be mitigating. So most founders, uh, and the, I'll say vast majority, 90 plus percent of founders are likely okay stipulating that if there's a market, uh, I will be able to build a product. Like even in HubSpot's case, yes, you know, it's a broad platform. It's like, but it's not, we're not putting someone on Mars. We're not inventing a new energy source, right? This is, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's been done, right? So it's, um, so we, and this is what we did at HubSpot. We stipulated that um, you know, the, our number one risk is that we kind of wander into this thing and we build something which we'll stipulate we can build, you know, I've built business applications before, not that big a deal, um, is that it'll be market risk. Like, I'm not sure if there's a large enough market that we can uh, make the economics and the math work. Um, and so what founders should be solving for, uh, either in parallel or maybe even first, is figure out how to mitigate or understand that market risk as early as possible. And the way to do that is often to get a product out there in some form, start charging for it mm -hmm. in some form in order to kind of um, get a sense for whether there's a true market there or not. And so mm -hmm. then this comes down to kind of specialization versus the, the generalists. Um, then the question is like, so what do you need? What's the best possible path to mitigate that market risk? Uh, so one is, and this is gonna sound um, even in a product company, maybe before you get a specialist in engineering or whatever, um, maybe you need someone on the growth side in sales or marketing or something like that, because in order to kind of uh, get a product out there to market and try to sell it, mm -hmm. um, you're going to possibly need someone that's kind of done that before, um, if, if you if you can. So one of the, in, in HubSpot's case, uh, we were fortunate because my co-founder has a sales background, right? That's uh, He grew up in sales. And, um, and, and we both had this a uh, very strong alignment that we want to solve for market risk and make sure there was a market because time, you know, mm -hmm. time was precious. We didn't want to spend five years figuring out, you know, later that, oh, you know, we built this great product, but there's really not enough of a market to, to make it worthwhile. And so he did something that was really, really smart um, in terms of mitigating market risk. So when we decided to hire our first salesperson, um, 
he went off not, not after not just a specialist, but he went after the best salesperson he had ever worked for in his professional career. It's like, I'm going to mm -hmm. bring this person in. The reason he did that is that, okay, we're going to have this person uh, go out there and try and sell the product in whatever mm -hmm. form it's in. If he's unable to sell the product, the problem is us, not him, right? Because he's like, I've seen this guy sell before. Oh. This is, He's not learning on the job or whatever. And he's sold a technology product before. It's not that different from what he's done in the past. Right. Otherwise, what ends up happening is when you bring in someone that's um, either more junior, just less experienced or different domain, something's different. Uh, founders will often say, oh, well, they just don't understand the industry. They don't understand the product. They're not selling it right. They're not telling the right story. It's, it's not... Right. Uh, and, and they may not attribute all the blame to the, the salesperson, mm -hmm. but probably a inappropriate level of the blame. It's like, uh, you know, and so we try to take that factor kind of out of the equation that says, okay, if this, if this guy can't sell the product, then the product is not sellable. That's the thing we, right. uh, we're trying to solve for. But that's one example of, uh, and the other one is, is more intuitive, which is if you are solving a deep technology problem um, and the and, and you need someone to help solve. It's like, okay, well, this is what we're doing. And, but often like the one of the founders usually is the one that has that deep experience in whatever that technology or whatever that particular domain happens to be. But um, that's another reason to do a specialist, um, yeah, specialist hire. That's that's really, really interesting. I, I, I bucket progress, early stage progress into one category, which is there's like no movement, right? There's like no pulse at all. And then the you know framework there can be give it some X amount of time. And if you haven't made any progress in X amount of time, you can then call it, iterate, whatever it is. Then there is the more um, uh, dangerous is too strong of a word, but I'll just say that I can't come up with a better word right now, is where you have some pulse, some growth, but it's not at that slope that's actually critical to hit escape velocity. And in conversations with founders, the one thing I wish I can communicate, but some like it's more of a feeling is you product market fit, right? You just know it when you have it because the thing is getting pulled out of you. And there've been many, you know, um, phrases to communicate when you've hit product market fit. The best one is a punch in the face. Um, and you're like, you literally have no time and you're just trying to, you know, customers are banging down the door trying to get in. But um, I'm curious how, like, how do you think about that second category where you have some pulse, but it's just not enough to hit escape velocity. Yeah, uh, I, I think the word you use is actually um, exactly correct, which is dangerous. The most dangerous ideas are good ideas, not bad ideas. Mm -hmm. Great ideas are awesome. Bad ideas are actually awesome because it's like, okay, well, obviously this was a bad idea. The good ideas are the ones that uh, kind of, um, you know, consume a bunch of time and cycles. And the same thing is with progress. Great mm -hmm. progress, awesome, things are going, going our way. Zero progress also because like, failure is not the worst outcome, right? Failure is something then you can say, oh, well, that did not work. We failed. Mm -hmm. Now we can go on and do something different. The worst outcome is not failure, but it's mediocrity. It's like, yeah. oh, we're making incremental good progress this month, this quarter, this year, two years, however long. And it's just enough of a pulse to say, okay, that this thing, this idea is not dead yet. And then you kind of hang on to that last vestige of hope and say, oh, maybe something will change. And sometimes things do. And, and there's mm -hmm. lots of stories of, oh, founders just needed to hang on long enough. And then the timing became right. Something changed. And that something might be the market changed around you. And all of a sudden now the market's ready for the thing that you were out, out selling, whatever it is. Um, but you have to be really careful um, in, in assessing the value of kind of good progress, right? It's, mm -hmm. uh, and, it's, 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 and it doesn't, once again, it's not a magnitude issue. It's a like repeatability issue, like and um, and then making sure that the progress that you're trying to measure as progress is actually progress. For instance, it's like oh, we talked to 50 potential customers this month versus you know only 25 last month. Oh, how many bought? Well, still zero. Well, that's not really progress, right? You may call us like okay, you had more conversations, fine, uh, and and then you could also say oh well, you know. 20 people expressed interest and said we would buy this product um, if it existed kind of thing versus only 10 said that last month. Well, mm -hmm. all that really means is a no, right? Like, like people are generally nice, especially the people that you're kind of talking to if you're an early stage founder. So you have to make sure that um, I would rather take sound, ob objective progress, however small, 
versus kind of distorted, misguided. It's like, oh yeah, this number is huge, but it's a number that doesn't mean anything. It's like, that's not really, um, yeah. So, because the world is really, really good about shining positivity on your idea and you and you're awesome and the startup is great. I would buy this product up until the point that you ask them for money, right? And that's the thing. It's like, okay. And that's the, at the end of the day, that's the true market is the market that you're going after. It's like, and um, so we're, I'm personally a very, very strong advocate of even when your product sucks, which in uh, in HubSpot's case, you know, the product wasn't even in beta, it was an alpha. And we put mm -hmm. it out there and ask people for money, right? It's not a lot of money, yeah. but some money. Um, and the motivation there was the only real way to know whether someone's going to pay money for this is to ask them to pay money for this, right? Uh, and then, and then the flip side of it is that, um, you know, I'm a big believer in charge early, uh, which is kind of get the product out there and then charge often. Mm. And the charge often part is around having um, like a recurring revenue model, which is great. Everybody does that, but going kind of month to month. And the reason is, and we can talk more about this uh, later and that kind of shifts, but in the early days, you want every single customer you have to kind of vote with their dollars. So every single, in the early years of HubSpot, every single customer was all on a month to month basis. So every month, we knew that, okay, yeah, we may have been able to talk them into buying the product, mm -hmm. but they have to talk themselves into staying and continue to pay us after that kind of initial, like when you're, uh, when a salesperson selling, we can be charming as founders, the charming and, and, uh, and, and convincing. But, uh, but then, you know, at month two, month three, month six, if the customer is still paying, yeah. despite the fact the product sucks, that means you found some acute pain, that despite the product sucking, they're willing to continue based on the sheer hope that you're mm -hmm. going to make the product better over time. That's a, that's much stronger evidence of product market fit versus a, well, we got this Fortune 500 company to uh, approve this kind of proof of concept or whatever. We're going to go and you know spend a month or whatever, and it's a hundred thousand person company. Yeah, yeah, but that's they do this all week. You know, this is not uh, anyway. So you, you said something really interesting: um, acute pain, right? And the importance of building around acute pain and I'm, I'm curious, what, what, what are signs that you're starting to um, build around acute pain? Is there something in the conversation with customers where you hear it and you're like, yep, there's something here, right? Because you, you also said, said something really important earlier, which is um, people are just too nice. Everyone will say your idea is good. They, they don't want to be, uh, and, and sometimes they just don't think about it enough. It's like, yeah, sounds like a cool idea. But the problem is you get lulled into complacency and mediocrity when what is actually needed is a great idea and a great idea comes from some acute pain a customer's feeling. So what is what are signs that a customer is feeling acute pain? All right. So here's my, I think we're up to two now, um, kind of counterintuitive, uh, possibly controversial um, advice here, which is the natural thing for founders to do is you have a product, you have an idea, um, and you'll get conversations with customers and you'll say, hey, here's this thing, whatever. Let's, let's say we can phrase the question that way. You know, is this something that, is this a pain you're experiencing right now? Is this an acute pain? Maybe even on a scale of zero to 10, like how painful, or how you know, big of a fit is this? And I think um, a much better approach is to flip that on its head, which is instead of saying, oh, I've got this idea, I've got this product, Whichever market you're selling into, and this is once again what HubSpot did, um, part of our founding story was around. So we, you know, we talked to these law firms and they said, like, oh, like, and the question was like, okay, so what pain did they have? Like, we didn't go in there offering, you know, a marketing product or whatever. It's like, oh, we're having the conversation. So the, um, a better approach is once you've identified a segment of customers you're going after, get the conversations. And once again, people are nice. So they'll probably give you an audience. Um, and then instead of pitching an idea or pitching your product or pitching your startup, just ask them the open-ended question. Um, my favorite is, what kinds of things are keeping you up at night? Mm, yeah. Right? It's like, what, what's the actual burning issue that's happening for you right now? And maybe 90% of the time, the answer they give you is not going to be relevant to the thing you're doing. It's like, okay, it's interesting to know that that's a problem. But some of the time, right, you're going to say, oh, well, that's not exactly what we had in mind. Mm. But there's, there's a thread of a connection there. And in some cases, if you hear that acute pain often enough within the car, you know, target customers you've already picked, it's like, that might be a better idea. Uh, maybe we're not far enough along in the thing we were thinking. Mm -hmm. And you know, eight out of 10 people that we talked to said this was a burning pain. Like, this is an issue right now. Um, so if you have the opportunity, I think the better thing um, 
is to go in with kind of more of an open mind. Um, and if you want to know what people's pain is, ask them what their pain is versus asking them whether this particular thing will solve a pain because then they're going to look for look for ways to please you, look for ways to make you happy and say, oh yeah, yeah, you know, we do have this issue with project management where we need mm -hmm. something that's, you know, and Monday and Asana don't really do it. And we want, it's like, nah, you're leading the witness a little bit, right? It's like just by yeah. virtue of, uh, you know, you being the founder you are and the, the idea that you've got, so yeah. And are there other questions that start to pull this out? So I really like that. What, uh, you know, what keeps you up at night? Are there other versions of that that you found useful? Um, they're all variations of the same, Fry. I, I tend to stick to that one because, and I ask this of founders too. Uh, it's not just uh, um, customers. <laughs> Let me think through it. You could flip it on its head, which is um, and, and instead of talking about pain, that says, okay, well, especially you know, right now we're in uh, essentially a kind of budget planning cycle for lots of companies, um, um, big and small. And you could ask them, it's like, okay, well, you know, where do you, what are you most excited about? What is the opportunity and what are you fighting for to get on the budget or what, what's the thing that you know is going to get approved going into next year because that's something you're, you think is going to kind of move the needle for your company. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the flip side of the pain, which is the opportunity. Like what's the thing you're most excited about doing? Uh, and it, and mm -hmm. at times like they'll just tell you, it's like, oh yeah, we're considering doing X. We want to launch a community thing or we want to you know um, go off and pursue this particular market or we're thinking about going global and doing international, whatever it is. Um, and and you, it has to be kind of open enough to kind of get their top two or three because the top one likely is not going to kind of match up to what you may or may not be doing. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and just one kind of related thought on this. Um, I think founders would be well served. Like it's very tempting uh, for founders because we're we're product people for the most part. Um, is we kind of align ourselves with our product and our solution. We could kind of kind of get married to that. It's like, ah, oh, this is my product. I love it. And I, you know, it's like I caress it every night. Um, instead, it's better to kind of attach yourself to a kind of burning market problem, right? And it's like, it's like, a, what's the problem that's out there that like people care about, you know, based on the conversation we just had? And then think through like, and there are always different ways to solve that problem, mm -hmm. right? Um, and your solution may be it, maybe that's the right way, uh, but don't get too locked into your current conception of what the solution should be, um, mm -hmm. but really dig into the problem and understanding that problem because you might find over time mm -hmm. that there are better, um, and it might be that either there's a better way to solve the problem or there's a better product that will be easier to sell under, with the underlying business model or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, so you sort of kind of, you know, fixate on the fixate on the problem and understanding it and then look for uh, the product that best solves it, the product that's easier to go to market with, the product that's, that the story that's easiest to tell is a combination of factors. It doesn't have to necessarily be, oh, like we solve this in a technically optimal way. That's part of it, sure. But it might yeah. be other things. Yeah. And how important do you think um, it's, it, it is for the founder to have that problem themselves, right? I think there's one school of thought, which is solve your own problem, right? Because then you can have the conversation in your head and you're basically talking to yourself, they're like, yep, this is a burning problem for me. And then you do it. And then you're, um, I, I think the, the hope there is that other people have the same problem versus uh, a more methodical approach in picking a market customers and then searching for that problem. In an ideal world, if you have the problem or someone you're really, really close to happens to have that problem, um, that helps a lot. Um, but practically though, um, it's like if it, what you end up, doing though is that, and this is I think a mistake a lot of um, early stage tech founders make, is that the problems they've most recently had, um, if they're relatively mm -hmm. early in their careers, are problems they had when they were a university student, right? It's like, oh, you know, it's really hard to find uh, when my favorite band is going to be in town or whatever. It's like, it's, mm -hmm. or, you know, just like, and the same problems occur for a large group of people. Um, and the existence of that problem for yourself does not necessarily correlate with the existence of that problem in the broader universe. So, um, and in fact, it's almost negatively correlated sometimes. The fact that you have that problem means either lots of people are already solving it because they've all had that same idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to come up with some twist on it. Uh, but one thing, and this is, I've got a, a slight bias here, but one of the, so there's two things. One is either a problem you've already had, um, but then there's the kind of related idea of a product you as a startup yourself would use. Mm -hmm. after you start the company, right? Um, so can you be a customer of your own product is the, is the question mm -hmm. right now. Yep. And so this is one of the advantages of um, building for 
um, SMBs versus um, enterprise. The, the challenge with building for enterprise is that chances are, if you're going after the Fortune 1000 uh, insurance tech companies or whatever, chances are you have not started an insurance tech company or whatever. You may have worked in one and you sort of have some sense of what's going on, but that's not your thing. But mm -hmm. most people are very, very close to someone that's in the small or have, you know, either have family members or themselves. The startup itself is basically a small business uh, when it's starting. So that this was very helpful to HubSpot. So when we started, you know, we were, you know, we were talking about all these kind of marketing tools and analytics and making it easy or whatever. We built it for ourselves. So, you know, every mm -hmm. night I'd be writing code and every morning my co-founder was trying to use the stuff that we had just built and find seven more bugs. And we mm -hmm. could kind of keep iterating on the thing that we needed for ourselves. And then we kind of expanded the pool. It's like, oh, what are other companies like us that have a similar problem? Um, and that that's super helpful. So I'm a big believer right. when possible to be your own customer. Now yeah. there are trade-offs. So we can talk about this as you scale um, because you may um, later um, find that you are no longer the ideal uh, target customer anymore because you've outgrown your customer base. Like you're like, for instance, HubSpot mm. sells to small, medium-sized businesses, which is, you know, we kind of equate to being uh, between two and 2000 employees. HubSpot itself is 7,000 people now, right? Mm -hmm. So when I talk to our product team, it's like, okay, well, we're very, very sophisticated. And they, and they come back with pushback, which is, is legitimate, which is, hey, I'm not sure we should be listening to HubSpot's marketing team or sales team anymore because HubSpot's 7,000 people. We're solving for these you know, sub-2,000 employee companies right? and all good arguments, but uh, and I've been on the winning side of this debate, but like the, the upside of us being our own customer is just too high. So yeah. we kind of try to uh, mitigate that particular tension um, as best we can. But yeah, it helps with the um, crafting of the product, right? You use yeah. it, and you have all yes. those back loops. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, still continue to focus on the on the startup and idea generation phase. Um, I'm curious, um, how do you think about picking ideas that have natural moats that are baked into? Right, so you can pick one idea where yep. many others are going into it, meaning there's you know, many companies and effectively um, all the margins just get competed away. Um, yep. Then you have sort of, uh, you, know, you have Google, right? Google yep. is sure. really in a, in a league of its own and effectively has pure monopoly, uh, large modes and all that. How important is it to consider that in the earliest stages of an idea? Really high, um, like it should be, and we can, so let's say one were to create a, um, a Google sheet and every column are factors by which we measure the quality of an idea. Like one could be, what's the total addressable market? One could be, you know, how much capitalization will it require? How long will it take to get to a V1? All these things. And one of them will be in the event this idea works, what's, is there a natural moat? Is there a natural kind of barrier to barrier to entry? Um, I don't know. If I will say this. Uh, the coefficients for those columns are not equally weighted as far as if we're trying to write a function to calculate um, the, you know, the quality of a, a given idea, but that kind of, if you can find it, if you can design a natural moat into the business or find a variation of the idea that has that natural moat, um, mm -hmm. it doesn't just help in the early, I mean, it's, it may make it marginally harder in the early years because a lot of those moats, if you're looking for things like network effects, have a certain critical mass that's required that you have to sort of hit before uh, the true network value starts to kick in, but it's still worth it um, because simply mm -hmm. because those things are hard to kind of kind of cycle back around and say, yeah, you know, we kind of just got started without even thinking about moats or uh, competitive barriers. And then you find yourself, you know, three, four or five years in where you now you've identified a market um, and everyone's like, oh, the water is warm. Why don't we also do that? Right. It's um, and, and that will happen. So I think it's super useful if you can to uh, and you may or may not find one that's compelling enough, um, but it's worth calories at least trying to think of an idea that um, that has a natural mode to it. Hmm. Related to that, you know, there's one part which are modes. How important do you think uh, considering your distribution hooks are early on versus is that just something is, that's okay to discover as, the, as you're executing on the idea? It's okay to discover, but you should try to do it relatively quickly um, for a couple hmm. of reasons. One is... Um, a lot of the kind of distribution mechanics, um, even more so sometimes in product, um, have compounding advantages. So the earlier you can start something and discover what the thing is like. So let's say you're going to do, you know, product-led growth, or you're going to do some kind of content strategy, or you're going to build a community first. Uh, you're an open source product, so whatever it is. Um, 
it's really important to kind of test out, um, you know, one or more kind of distribution models. And that's almost as important, like your kind of go to market fit is probably as important as your product market fit, right? So the product could fit the market really well, but if you have, don't find an efficient way to kind of get to that market, mm -hmm. it's still like do not pass go, do not collect $200 because you just couldn't, um, you know, couldn't break through and, and create the, the scale that you needed. So I'm a big believer in, um, and now it's easier to kind of try things. We have lots of new models in place um, in, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, distribution strategies. Um, and, and you can, act, you know, like steal from other industries. It's like, okay, well, you know, I'll take a thing that someone did in direct to consumer market and apply it to my kind of B2B SaaS company or whatever. Those things often do work, right? It's like, okay, the, the world is different now than it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our industry hasn't caught up without whatever that change or shift has happened. Um, I'm going to apply that kind of consumer style thinking to, you know, a B two B distribution model, which hadn't really been done that much before. It's becoming more common now. So let's dig in on that because you're you're talking about something really interesting, which is um, that magic hap magic happens at the intersection of skill sets, right? You're able to pull something from one industry or skill set and pull it another one together, and if it's complementary, you have some unique insight. So. If you're a founder that's starting out today, how would you think about what skills they should focus on acquiring first, such yes. that they can then create the magic at the intersection? The way magic actually occurs at the intersection is um, is a little bit around rarity, right? Um, so, you know, I, I think about this, you know, kind of skill sets um, as like a Venn diagram. So you have, and this applies at an individual, you know, founder level, applies at a team level or a company level. Um, but the way to think about it is like, okay, well, what are the combination of things that separately, you know, might be somewhat common or somewhat rare, but the intersection almost never occurs together. Like these things almost never like, um, you know, come together. And that's what makes it special is because value is around rarity, right? It's like the less of something there is, the more valuable it is. Um, it's from here in a raw economics perspective. So what I would suggest is, you know, let's let's talk at a founder level to say, oh, the skill that I have right now, I'm a product builder, I'm an engineer, I, I know how to do that really, really well. Most people that are engineers are actually not really good at community building or content writing or public speaking or say mm -hmm. whatever it is. It's like, okay, well, that's actually a useful skill to build. It's like you know, you show me an engineer that can do like copywriting really, really well. That's in the top two percent or whatever. Those folks are going to win, right? That that's you know just pulling those two things together, or someone that's, um, or if you have a kind of a business background, it's like I really know kind of direct to consumer marketing. I'm going to go off and kind of learn and, and like product management or something like that. It's like pulling those two kind of often divergent skills together, um, mm -hmm. and so that's kind of thing number one. Thing number two is you don't need a lot of them. Uh, I think the, a mistake founders make is like, oh, well, I have these 18 weaknesses. And mm -hmm. I'm going to fix all my weaknesses and get them to some like um, kind of acceptable level. Yeah, I mean, like if you know one of your weaknesses is that uh, you know you have serial killer tendencies, by all means, fix that. Right, that's a, a, a <laughs> thing that you should be fixing. But absent that, it's like you're better off saying this is the thing I'm great at, and I'm going to dig in and I'm going to get exceptional at that thing. Or this mm -hmm. is the thing the company is great at, and we're going to get exceptional at that thing. And then find the complementary skill that says, okay, well, there's a fair number of people that are exceptional at this thing, but people that are exceptional at that and this thing over here, well, that almost never happens, right? Like mm -hmm. that's the skill set to go to go acquire. Um, so it's like in, in HubSpot's case, the thing that our kind of intersecting Venn diagrams is we were, you know, like the engineering was not you know, particularly impressive. We were not doing something hard from a you know, product perspective. But it was the intersection of attaching ourselves to a uncommon customer, which is mm -hmm. small, medium sized businesses, intersected with a new at the time go to market model to say, hey, um, we're going to price this super cheaply. We're going to spend millions of dollars on content and, and pulling mm -hmm. people in through things that like, uh, which is also the idea that we were kind of advocating for. But that that's sort of what made it made it special. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. So. It sounds like the framework here is to really, once you've picked a market or you've picked a problem to go after, is to then think about what makes you unique to tackle it, yes. right? Like what are the yeah. intersection of skills that you have, company has, 
uh, to be able to have a unique view of how and differentiated view of how you're going to go execute on this. Yes. And lots of people have written and talked about this, right? Is And the more unique you are, the more resistance you're going to feel because it's like, okay, well, that, that's just weird. That's just odd. That will never work, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, founders hear that all the time. And it's important to be able to separate. And sometimes they're right. It's like, okay, well, that is too weird. That likely won't work. But, yeah. But just, you know, five people telling you um, that's weird and unique does not necessarily mean that you shouldn't do that, right? You have to somehow yeah. kind of sift through the, okay, and have the courage of your conviction to say, yeah, but this feels right. And when we're talking to customers and like, that is an acute pain. Like I know it's really expensive to hire, you know, acquire SMB customers. I know the LTV to CAC is nowhere near what we need it to be because it's not a sustainable business, but it's like, but it makes sense, right? Like it's like, okay, we understand why. It's like we sort of always knew that small businesses should be benefiting from the internet. Yeah, they're hard, hard to acquire as customers. That's not their problem. That's our problem. Uh, you know, yeah. it's like we'll find a way to more efficiently reach them. Um, and so is the opposite true? If, um, if uh, many people are saying your idea is great, it's not a great idea? Like it, shouldn't um, be it, it might be a great idea, but it might not be great in, this, in the sense that you're probably going to get just a lot of competition because it's more obvious. Mm -hmm. uh, so more people right. are going to try it because more people are going to think it's a great idea. Um, and so, you know, what you're trying to do as, you know, in terms of idea selection and kind of early stages, you're looking for this arbitrage opportunity, right? And the mm -hmm. arbitrage is around finding an idea that's good enough to pursue, mm -hmm. but not obvious that most others wouldn't do it, right? It's like, okay, well, it's not so crazy that even I, like, I, I have no idea how we would actually kind of pull this off. Uh, and so you're looking for that. It's like, okay, well, the world has not yet recognized, um, but they will someday that this is actually a good idea. So in our case, the world had not yet recognized that SMB was an exceptionally great market yeah. to build 10 plus billion dollar decacorns. Um, and, and then over time it became, and now lots of companies have done that, right? And done really yeah, well in the makes SMB sense. space. So. Um, I'm, I'm curious how you think about platform shifts and paradigm shifts uh, related to idea selection. Um, you know, the paradigm shifts of the last decade if we're to summarize, I mean, Chris Dixon had a great tweet on it recently. It was social, cloud, and mobile. And yep. then the paradigm shifts of the next decade seem to be crypto, AI, and VR. Yeah. And so curious, how much do you think about these big shifts as unlocking um, new ideas and how much attention should founders pay to paradigm shifts uh, that can create new needs or new go-to-market opportunities? Yeah, I think... I think it's a very big deal um, in terms of like recognizing these paradigm shifts. So, so if mm -hmm. I go back even to my own career, um, what ends up happening, like the best ideas are usually the intersection of something you know with something that's new. It's like, okay, well, like this is actually a relatively good idea, but it just wasn't possible five years ago. Like the thing that we needed, the paradigm shift that is now here was not here, you know, three years ago, five years ago, and now it is here. So things that historically have not been possible at, at scale or economically, whatever the, the constraint was, is now possible. So I'm a big believer in kind of watching those, right? The hard part about it is really um, separating what's a actual paradigm shift versus a mm -hmm. like, okay, well, that's cool and interesting. It'll unlock some use cases, but it's not like a world changing thing like the kind of internet uh, V1 was. Mm -hmm. So to, it's one thing was I think um, this is one of the things that gives founders an advantage is that they are much more likely to be open to those things that are happening. They're already using those things that are happening, right? And so then the little dots connect in your head. It's like, oh, after you've done your first uh, crypto purchase, right? It's like, okay, well, or you build your first blockchain app or you did uh, you know, use Dolly 2. It's like, oh, mm -hmm. well, if it can do that, maybe you can also do this thing over here that no one ever thought was possible before, right? Um, right. I think that's, that's a big deal. Um, and so I think, well, talking about those three things that were in, uh, I, I saw Chris's tweet. I love, uh, uh, he's one of the smartest people I know. The one part that I would push back on, so he identified crypto as being one of the mega trends. Um, I don't think it's crypto. I think it's one level of abstraction higher. So crypto is cryptocurrency, um, is, is around kind of web three. And I know that's a, and I hate versioning the web. Um, <laughs> I was against it back in the web two days when we first started yeah. doing it but this kind of collection of technology, including uh, crypto and blockchain that creates this kind of de um, decentralized web, I think is, is the actual macro trend that's uh, going to happen. Not that you know, all data is gonna necessarily exist on the blockchain or mm -hmm. you know, uh, NFTs of you know, uh, Bored Apes is gonna be the, the thing, uh, but, but I think this notion of 
Um, we're going to digitize everything, which is what really NFTs are, is we're going to attach a, a digital token to either digital goods or physical goods, everything, which mm-hmm. can then be traded and fractionalized and all those things. I think that's a massive, massive kind of paradigm shift, that whole that whole notion of um, kind of a decentralized web, like universal identity. You know, right now it's like, oh, you log in with Google, you log in with Facebook, or, you know, it's like, and or, you know, if the company's big enough, they have their own user's table sitting somewhere in their, in their internal database. Well, from a consumer's perspective, that doesn't really make sense for our identity to be locked up into one individual um, um, corporation, right? It needs to be decentralized, uh, just like email addresses in, in a way are, like they're, they're portable because domains are portable. Um, anyway, we don't have to get into that. Mm-hmm. But uh, answering the original question, yes, I think those trends are important, um, but doesn't necessarily because we haven't had, so I think mobile was big for, you know, lots of industries um, and for every year for like, you know, at least, you know, 11 years, it was like, oh, this is the year of mobile. This is the year of mobile. and 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 it's all been good. Like, you know, we're daily consumers, obviously. Um, but in terms of like the, it was not in my mind, kind of scale of what like Web One was, right? Like that was the kind of mind exploding. Holy crap! Like this is like now everyone's connected to this universal network. Um, mm-hmm. Mobile was big, but not in that same kind of in that same realm in my mind. Um, so, but we'll right. See. And um, in in running HubSpot, as you're you know you mentioned earlier, um, thinking about what are the defensive moves, and then maybe sometimes product expansion. Um, are you always keeping up? Like, are you staying up to speed with some of the new uh, paradigm shifts and platform shifts? Like, is it almost like every day, every month, you like you you're staying very close to it to understand how it may impact the business or impact the ideas that you pursue. Yeah. Every day, um, <laughs> every day and every night. Um, yeah. I, so I think of that as like most of my job, right. It's um, mm-hmm. and I've, I, I've got the things I work on at HubSpot down to um, three things mm-hmm. and I, I'll change them every few years. Um, and I've had, you know, platform obviously on it. Uh, culture has been on it for, um, for many, many years, but one of the longest standing items I have in my list of three things is boldness, which is how do I push the organization to take on the risk to see what's coming up around the corner and make those investments. Um, and because that's usually as you go from kind of startup to scale up, and this has been, you know, documented uh, for decades now is around, you know, what uh, uh, Clay Christensen used to call the, the well, um, like Clay Christensen called the innovator's dilemma, which is, you know, once things start to work, um, your kind of propensity to try out new things that would disrupt the things that are working, just go down over time, because you have a lot more to lose. Um, it's like, okay, well, things are already working. And then, you know, uh, you know, world does you know shift fast. So I'm, I'm and partly it's just, I'm super curious about it. And so I, I will say this. So you know, I've been building commercial software companies now for 30 years um, since I started my first one. And right now, this time is actually, other than what Web1 is the most excited I've been in terms of like shifts in technology. Like I mean, I've, I've been around, you know, spots been around for the last 16 years and we've seen things come, we think it's like, uh, and it's a combination. And I think he's, by the way, so he's mostly right. He, uh, Chris Dixon, mostly right about the crypto Web3 thing. Oh, uh, AI, ML, he's like, spot on like right about it's like it's um like if if you're in software right now and you're not thinking about how ml is going to impact your industry your business uh you, you are missing the boat that's uh so it's, it's similar to to, to sort of get, get to a wrap up um i'd like to end on a note of venture capital and venture funding and when yeah. founders should consider it or not consider it uh one of the themes i've seen is, um, and, and I think it's because it's glorified quite a bit, is this endless chase to raise money, right? And that becomes the thing that founders focus on. But in most cases, when you really dig in and when I've dug in, there's no deep desire to build a venture scale company because it is a treadmill. Uh, so I'm yeah. curious, what, what's your advice to founders on how to think about whether to raise venture funding or not? Yeah, a couple of things. One is, um, so venture capital is a product um, that is, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way or a positive way, it's a product. Um, and it may or may not be a fit for what your needs are and the type of business that you're building. I think the mis- there's two mistakes uh, com- founders commonly make. One is assuming 
that like, you know, step one is like, I've had the idea, I've sifted through the ideas, I've picked the thing, and now I'm going to go write a pitch deck and I go off and uh, you know, start pitching VCs and, and go raise venture capital. I think that's a mistake. Uh, the reason it's a mistake, because the most common outcome for that exercise, all things being equal, is you're going to fail to raise money, number one. You're going to spend a bunch of time solving the investor's problem in terms of what they don't like about the idea or the business model or your pitch deck or you uh, versus solving customer problems, right? It's And if it was the, oh, like at the end of it, I'm going to... So here's, I'll say a few things, um, all of them controversial, actually. Um, <laughs> so one is around... So I'm, I'm somewhat against venture capital, not for the common reasons. I don't really care that much about dilution. Like we're past the stage um, where like most deals are fair deals now. There's uh, the variance between, they're like, um, so if someone walks up to you, you have a reasonably good idea and a VC shows up at your doorstep and says, here's a $10 million check, take the money. Take the money, you'll be able to do good things with it, fine. I was like, I'm not opposed to dilution. I'm not even that opposed to the kind of loss of control and getting on the treadmill, fine. If you, if you feel like you wanna kind of uh, take that journey, you should take that journey. Mm -hmm. The challenge is that that's not how it turns out, right? The expected value, the odds of you actually successfully raising capital, which is the what you know, are actually relatively low. So unless you have some inside track, you went to YC, you went to a great school, you have access, like somehow some compelling reason why you've done it before, um, then maybe you should go. At, or the idea is this, it's a, it can't be done without venture capital. It's like, okay, well, like HubSpot is a perfect example. When Brian and I started the company, one of the decisions we made at time t equals zero is that we want to build a massive, sustainable, successful SaaS company. And as it turns out, those require venture capital. And you would think as a software company, like, you know, and my prior two startups were both bootstrapped, right? So it's like, that's what I knew. I'd never raised venture capital before. So if you need to raise venture capital, fine. Uh, but don't jump to the conclusion that you need to raise venture capital. That's thing number one. Thing number two, if you decide to go out and raise venture capital and don't succeed, all that has really told you is that this is likely not a venture backable idea. That doesn't mean it's a bad idea and doesn't mean that it's a bad business, right? Like mm -hmm. there's what would have been good to great businesses that are out there that get turned down by venture capital all the time, right? Or would get turned down if they had gone out and you know, tried to raise capital. So those two things are not the same thing. A venture backable business is not a great business and a non-venture backable business is not a terrible business. Those are kind of independent thoughts you need to kind of hold in your head as a, as a, as a founder. Um, the good news now is, um, you know, and I've been angel investing the angel community now um, takes a lot of the kind of pain that was associated with the venture capital kind of out of the equation uh, in terms of the logistics and things like that. And you get kind of positive network effects in terms of being uh, be able to access people that are interested in your sector versus just going down the top 20 kind of VC list and there are you know, trade-offs there as well. And I'm certainly biased um, being an angel investor myself, but my advice is, Either ask yourself or someone you know whether the idea that you're pursuing is actually a venture fundable. Is does it, does it fit the profile of what should be a venture backed business? And if it's not, uh, don't spin your wheels. You just frustrate yourself and spend a bunch of calories that could have been spent productively on building a product and getting revenue in the door, which is anti dilutive for the record, uh, customer revenue. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I and um, <clears throat> you actually. You, you, you effectively have more options when you're not taking venture capital, right? Because the types of outcomes that you can say yes to uh, increase because typically there are veto rights uh, as soon as you take on venture capital on the outcomes and the range of outcomes start narrowing quite a bit. Um, yeah. Well, I could keep going on so many topics. Um, I know we're, we're actually r r running up on time here. Uh, so again, wanted to thank you for your time. Um, this has been incredibly insightful and inspirational. Uh, I've got a lot of notes myself. Uh, so thank you again. Yeah, thanks for having me.